Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all here safely. We thank you for the Sabbath, um, that we can come together and consider your word. And as we take up this study and uh, continue through this weekend looking at this material, we ask that your Holy Spirit and your angels would guide and direct, give us um, enlightenment that we can understand um, this message, how you would have us understand it, and help it be used by your Holy Spirit to change us um, into a position where you can use us to help finish this work and we might go home soon, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> There's, in this um, presentation this weekend, the, one of the basic things that we're going to try to nail down tonight and uh, then, then use as a point of reference is that Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and ending. And we're going to look at what that means in God's Word, and then we're going to look at a couple of examples where the beginning illustrates the end. And the, the one that we're going to spend uh, our time with at first, starting tonight, and then most of the day tomorrow, will be the Millerite time period from the history of 1840 to 1844, will be repeated at the end of the world to the very letter, to the very letter. And uh, then after we've, we've looked at that, we'll show that the story of Rome, how the papacy takes control of the world at the end of time, that is the message of the hour. And how the papacy takes control of the world at the end of time has been illustrated and how the papacy took control of the world the first time around. And the premise is, is that Jesus portrayed not only the end of Adventism with the beginning of Adventism, but he portrayed the end of Rome with the beginning of Rome. And, it, and it's not, we're not simply saying that this is an interesting concept to look at. We're suggesting that this truth must be understood by God's people. In fact, this truth is a truth that will be warred against um, within Adventism. So that's, that's where we're going. Uh, we're going to, the first presentation here, we're going to set up uh, a few rules of Bible prophecy that we will use throughout the weekend, and uh, I would challenge you to, to, try to try to understand these rules. They're simple, but make sure that you're in agreement with them. Uh, make sure that you're, you don't think that I'm putting a false slant on these rules, because if I'm not putting a false slant on these rules, uh, then how we apply them will be important. If I am putting a false slant on these rules, then you need to reject uh, this material, this presentation. But let's begin on page one of your handout. Um, Whatever may be man's intellectual advancement, let him not for a moment think that there is no need of thorough and continuous searching of the scriptures for greater light. As a people, we are called individually to be students of prophecy. Every Seventh-day Adventist is required to be a student of prophecy. In our presentations, we deal with this particular quote quite a bit, and the reason for it, that we deal with it quite a bit, is because we've been told our greatest need is for a revival. We've also been told that the revival comes to God's people from an understanding of, of prophecy, and if a person is not a student of prophecy, then they're not a, putting themselves in the position where they can be brought back to life at the end of the world, and they will be lost, just plain and simple. That's the that's the primary reason that we're called to be students of prophecy. It's because inspiration is clear that God awakens his people from the Laodicean condition at the end of the world through prophecy. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I have a hunch uh, that as I go through this material from time to time, I'm going to refer to some of the people in Adventism that oppose the different positions that we present in Bible prophecy. Um, not to be attacking them, but there is a, a controversy going on about what is the true message, and we have the responsibility to rightly divide the word of truth, to do it correctly. And some of us are sleeping. We don't even know there is an argument going on about these truths. So we're not involved with whether it's being rightly divided or not rightly divided. And... Uh, we need to be rightly dividing the word of truth because we're at the very end of time. Um, next quote, Evangelism 196. 
Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, most Seventh-day Adventists know that the three characteristics of the remnant church of God in the book of Revelation is they are the people that have faith, the faith of Jesus, um, the testimony of, of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, and they keep the commandments of God. That's the three characteristics of the remnant people of God, correct? The faith of Jesus is built upon the sure word of prophecy. The next quote, the word of God, just as it reads, is the ground of our faith. That word is the sure word of prophecy, and it demands implicit faith from all who claim to believe it. It is authoritative, containing in itself the proof of its divine origin. And this next quote from Desire of Ages is describing how Jesus was instructing the disciples um, and we'll read this, this part of it. Beginning at Moses, the very alpha of Bible history, Christ expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Had he first made himself known to them, their hearts would have been satisfied. In the fullness of their joy, they would have been hungered for nothing more. By the way, this is the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, not recognizing who Jesus is after the cross. He could have just exposed himself as Jesus, but he didn't do that. Um, Continuing on, it says, But it was necessary for them to understand the witness borne to him by the types and prophecies of the Old Testament. Upon these their faith must be established. Christ performed no miracle to convince them, but it was his first work to explain the scriptures. They had looked upon his death as the destruction of all their hopes. Now he showed from the prophets that this was the very strongest evidence for their faith. And if you, there's other passages where similar things are described by, about Christ interacting with the disciples. And this is always pointed out. He could have performed a miracle, you know, and proved that he was God. But according to God, it was more important that they recognized who and what he was from the prophecies of the Bible than from a miracle. They needed to be, their faith needed to be established upon the prophecies of the Bible. Um... This next quote incorporates in it a principle that is, is one of the primary principles in the study of prophecy, and it, Sister White's going to say something here, and then she's going to quote Paul. And this rule here is, is one of the most important in, in the study of prophecy. It says, Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is for, in force for us. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's Paul. Not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. That's Peter. The Bible has accumulated and begat bound up together its treasures for this last generation, all the great and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. You have three prophets there. You have Ellen White, you have Paul, and you have Peter, and they're emphasizing that the stories in the Bible are examples of the end of the world. Now, I had a, a, a brother who is, uh, there's a self-supporting school that's within 10 minutes of our house in Ar Arkansas, has both an academy and, uh, and a college there. And the head of the college one time was um, trying to show why I was a heretic. And, and it was upon this principle that we're dealing with where he was insisting that I go off into darkness and I lead people astray. He's saying, yes, I agree with Paul that all these things in the Bible are, are examples of the end of the world. But what they are is they're, they're giving us examples of morality moral portrayals that we all need to understand. If we're going to stand as the 144,000 at the end of the world, then we need to understand these moral lessons. But the history that, that these stories of morality are portrayed in is not an illustration of a repeat of history at the end of the world. So he was agreeing with Paul in one sense, but he was denying that the illustrations in the Bible are actually illustrations of the end of the world. And, you know, I took him to a quote, if I could turn to it right here, 
where Sister White is clearly identifying a repeat of the midnight cry. Now, the midnight cry, it was fulfilled in the Millerite time period. If you turn to page 16, keep your, your finger in there. I'll show you this quote. This brother is telling me that he agrees that the prophets, the, the testimony of the Bible was an illustration for the end of the world, but all it illustrated was moral lessons. It didn't illustrate the history at the end of the world. And he was really taking me to task for suggesting that the Millerite time period is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. And it is, and we're going to show you that. And if on page 16, the second quote from the bottom, um, the part that is in bold type, it says, my mind was carried to the future. Do you see that? See, he admitted that the midnight cry took place in the Millerite time period. He knew that. So I said to him, I read this quote, it says, My mind was carried to the future when the signal will be given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. You can clearly see that Sister White is saying this same signal takes place at the end of the world that took place in the Millerite time period. This isn't the only place you can show that. But you know what he said when I read that to him? He says, Oh, Jeff, you know that Sister White was a careless writer. I said, oh, I'm done. And I got up and, and I walked away from the guy. And another brother that was sympathetic to what we were sharing, he went and he labored with this guy for a while. But I haven't spoke to that brother since. And I figured if, if we're not on the common ground that Sister White, it's nothing to do with careless writer or uncareless writer. Sister White is a prophet and the prophet is being directed by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's writing through the prophets in the Bible, and it's the Holy Spirit that's writing through Sister White. And if you're going to say Sister White's careless, you're saying the Holy Spirit is careless. But what I wanted to bring that story in for is this principle, that each of the ancient prophets, back to page one, each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is enforced. This is perhaps one of the... I hesitate to say which is the most important rule of Bible prophecy because as a human being, how can we prioritize the rules of Bible prophecy that the Lord has designed? But this has to be right up there close to the top. The histories in the Bible are an illustration of the end of the world. And if you, don't, if you can't understand that, if you can't accept that by faith, you're going to have a difficult time applying prophecy because that's what prophecy is. Prophecy is history in advance. You'll see on the next page the Definition for in sample. Sister White said each of the prophets spoke more, less for their own time than for ours so that their prophesying is in force. And then she quotes Paul, which said all these things happened as in samples. You can see what in sample means there. It's a model. Uh, it's a figure of form, a pattern. It's a type, a resemblance. All these histories are types. They're illustrations of histories that are repeated at the end of the world. And then in Selective Messages, Book 3, by the way, there are several places that you can establish this. It's not like these are the only ones you can find in inspiration. These men of the Old Testament spoke of things transpiring in their day, and Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel not only spoke of things that concerned them as present truth, but their sights reached down to the future and to what should occur in these last days. 1 Corinthians 14.32 and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You think about what, that, what that's saying. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You know what that means? It means the prophets agree with one another. They're subject to one another. They, one prophet is not going to disagree with another prophet. Their spirits uh, of the prophets are subject to one another. You know what the next verse says? It's not here. You could look it up in the Bible. The next verse says, For God is not the author of confusion. You remember, you've heard that, you remember that verse in the Bible, God is not the author of confusion. Well, if Peter was saying one thing and Paul was saying something totally different, that would be confusing, right? The spirits of the prophets are subject to one another. They're all telling the same story. Why do I say they're all telling the same story? Because the stories in the Bible are an illustration of the end of the world, and if they're in agreement with one another, if the spirits of the prophets are subject to one another, then they're all telling the story about the end of the world. That... That's a big idea to get our minds around, but it's true. They're all telling the same story. Now, one prophet may have a, a, an illustration of the end of the world where he has an abundant about a, a amount of information about what takes place at the end of the world, and one other prophet in the Bible might just have a couple points, but his couple points agree with that other prophet, and they're all talking about the end of the world. Anyway, we'll try to, to bear that out as we go on. The other principle, um, upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. 
Uh, turn with me, if you would, if you have your Bibles, um, to Daniel, give you another example of a controversy, a prophetic controversy in Adventism today. <coughs> Daniel 11, verse 41. The message of the hour for Adventism is Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, tells how the papacy's deadly wound is healed. It tells how the papacy returns to take control of the earth. And in verse 41, I'm, I'm not defending anything at this point. <clears throat> I'm just going to share an, a dis, an argument in Adventism today. In verse 41, it says, He, that's the papacy, shall enter also into the glorious land. In Adventism today, there is an, an argument. Is the glorious land the United States of America during the time period that Sunday law comes into the United, into the United States? Or is the glorious land the Seventh-day Adventist church? I don't believe it's the Seventh-day Adventist church. I know it's the United States of America. But I know men in self-supporting work in Adventism that teach that the glorious land in verse 41 is the Seventh-day Adventist church. And recently, I've been interacting with the Biblical Research Department, the highest theological um, office in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they also believe that the glorious land is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Um, so when my point is this, when it comes to understanding correctly what prophecy is, you have to identify certain rules within God's word in order to be able to establish what truth is. Okay, you have to. Otherwise, it's your own idea. If you're gonna if you're gonna identify a symbol based upon your own idea, you can do that. But what's the Bible say about prophecy? Prophecy is of no private interpretation. The Bible has to define. Um, what is true prophetic understanding on its own terms? And one of those terms, on page two, one of the rules that does this, is that upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. If, something, if you can lay your finger on something two times in the Bible, that means not that, that you've discovered it, it means that God has established that as true. Now, notice the first one. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. That's in John 8, 17. And you can probably pull 15 different verses in the Bible out that will nail down this principle for you. But, but notice this next one. This is from John 5, 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Who said that? That's Christ. You know what Christ is saying there? He says, if I bear witness of myself, it's not true. Now, is there anything that Jesus has said, could say, or will say that isn't true? No, because the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. But what Jesus is doing is he's confirming that he's even governed by this particular principle. Upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. And you'll notice if you read on in chapter 5, it says, but there's one that beareth witness of me. The Holy Spirit confirms what Jesus says. It has to be upon the testimony of two that a thing is established. And, and this, this rule is important enough that Jesus is even dealing with this principle here once you realize it. It takes a testimony of two to establish a truth. Deuteronomy 17, 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Need two witnesses. Um... Anyway, 2 Corinthians 13, 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Genesis 41, 32, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. If you're going to identify something as truth in the Bible, you have to at least be able to show it twice. So... Those people in Adventism, from the Biblical Research Institute to the self-supporting ministries that insist that verse 41 of Daniel 11 is identifying when the Catholic Church conquers the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they need to show one other place in the Bible where this takes place, and it isn't there. There is no other verse that teaches that. It is not there. Therefore, I, I would submit that one of the arguments against that position is that it's nowhere else in Scripture, and if it was true, God would establish it by at least putting it in two places, and it, it doesn't happen. That is an example 
of how this rule of upon the testimony of two impacts what determines what truth, how you determine what is truth is. By the way, is there any place in the book of Revelation, I'm not talking the rest of the Bible, is there any place in the book of Revelation where you see a Sunday law coming into the United States? Revelation 13, 11, the United States is speaking as a dragon. So for someone to say that the glorious land in verse 41 is when the Sunday law comes into the United States, upon the testimony of two, it's there. You can show that that's a biblical truth. There is a point in time when a Sunday law comes into the United States but you don't find a place in the Bible where it shows that the papacy is conquering the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's just not there. And by the way, verse 41 of Daniel 11 is four verses before Daniel 12.1. What's Daniel 12.1? Michael stands up. And what's, what, what do we know happens when Michael stands up? Human probation closes. So we're talking about Four verses before human probation closes. We're talking, verse 41, the glorious land, when the papacy conquers the glorious land, whatever it is, we know it's right at the end of the world, just before human probation closes. And what do we know about God's church just before human probation closes? Is that it's 144,000 people that are giving the final warning message to mankind, perfectly reflecting Christ's character. Do you think at that point in history the papacy is going to be portrayed as conquering God's church? I don't. That's when the Bible's talking about God's church being victorious. So, I mean, upon the testimony of two, if we're going to look at some of these truths, which we're going to, upon the testimony of two, two a thing is established. Next quote is from a passage where Sister White is describing how the Millerites, during the Millerite time period, presented prophecy, presented the message. And she says, historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative de delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And uh, you notice the subtitle there, I have prophecy defined, because if you look closely at that, you see a very nice definition of what prophecy is. The word delineate means to set forth upon a line. So, what Sister White is saying is that when the Millerites identified prophecy, they would illustrate it on a timeline going down to the end of the world. She says, down to the close of this earth's history. So there's a direction to this timeline. It's somewhere in ancient history, but it's heading towards the end of the world. And she says, historical events were set before the people, and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events. So, prophecy is this. Prophecy is portrayed on a timeline going down to the end of the world, and what confirms the fulfillment of prophecy is not some philosophical concept. What confirms prophecy is historical events. It says historical events were set before the people, and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. There's only one other word in there that, that's worth touching on here before we move on. It's the word figurative. Sister White says these historical events were set before the people as fulfillments of prophecy, but they were also figurative. Let me give you an example of that. The Bible spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem if Israel was unfaithful. But what, as Seventh-day Adventists, what verse talks about that? Daniel 9, 26, 27. Um, says, uh, Verse 26 of Daniel 9 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, this Verse 26 is identifying the destruction of the city of Jerusalem because is, ancient Israel was, had broken the covenant and rebelled against God. Are everyone with me on that? When did that take place? What year? 8070? Pagan Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem. Is that right? Everyone with me here? Am I going too fast for us here? I do that sometimes, almost all times. So in AD 70, that's a historical event. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. A historical event is set before the people, and prophecy is seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. What does figurative mean? Symbolic. Figurative. 
What does Sister White say the destruction of Jerusalem represents in the beginning chapters of the Great Controversy? She says it's an illustration of the end of the world. This historical event was prefiguring the end of the world. This historical event was a fulfillment of prophecy. Daniel 9.26 was the prophecy. The historical event fulfilled that prophecy, but at the same time, it's prefiguring something at the end of the world. Do you see that? Okay. Um, I have more to do with this. So I, what I want us to see here is that prophecy is portrayed on a timeline heading down to the end of the world, and historical events <coughs> placed upon these timeline are what fulfill are identified as the fulfillment of prophecy. Review next the line of truth. Let's talk about the line for a second. We must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy. Inspiration talks about prophecy being portrayed on a line, on a line. And this is how we do it even in the world today. Non-Christians, non you can go into the, uh, into the bookstores and you can find these uh, timeline books where you know, they have everything that happened from 1900 to, uh, to any point in time. And they're, his, they're call them time, timelines, I think is what they call them. So that's all that, that the inspiration is saying here, is that prophecy, prophetic lines. Prophecy is history, historic lines. So we must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy and understand the specifications given by the prophets and by Christ and the apostles that we may not be ignorant, but be able to see that the day is approaching, so that with increased zeal and effort we may exhort one another to faithfulness, piety, and holiness. We need to understand the Bible well enough to be familiar with these lines of prophecy in the Bible that we can see that they're illustrating what's going on on planet Earth today is telling us that probation is about to close and Jesus is about to return, and we need to prepare a character for the seal of God or we're going to receive the mark of the beast. That's what that quote was saying in my mind. Isaiah, next page, Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. Speaking on the subject of, of true education, how we teach. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest herewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Brothers and sisters, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. This is Isaiah 28. And when he's talking about how we are to understand doctrine and truth in the Bible, he's talking, one of the things he's saying is that it's by bringing line upon line together. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. A prophetic line of truth from Isaiah needs to be brought together with a prophetic line of truth from Daniel, with a prophetic line of truth of John. You bring them together and the story just expands. And you know this is for the end of the world, this passage in Isaiah, because he says, to whom... He said, this is the rest herewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Do you know what the refreshing is in Bible prophecy? The re refreshing is the latter rain. He's talking about there's, there's a development of truth during the latter rain time period that comes about by bringing line upon line, precept upon precept. And so this is for us. Next quote, a specific location. It says, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pin is to remove, be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the old. Now, brothers and sisters, for, for some of you that aren't familiar with this, in Revelation 14, there are three angels that bring three messages into history. Revelation 18, four chapters later, there's a fourth angel that comes into history. And these angels came into history at a specific point in time. 
They have been located. We're going to show you this weekend, clearly, if you'll see it, that the first angel's message arrived in 1840. In fact, you can, it, we're going to get more specific. It, it came into history August 11th, 1840. The second angel's message came into history, anyone know? 1842, that's good. 1842. Now, the second angel's message didn't get proclaimed in 1842, but it arrived in history in 1842. The third angel's message came into history October 22nd, 1844. That's the three angels' message that Sister White says have been located. There are, these messages have a, a theological content. The first angel's message, fear God, give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. The first angel's message is announcing that judgment was going to be, begin. The second angel's message has a theological content, come out of Babylon. The third angel's message, a warning re against receiving the mark of the beast. It has a uh, an understanding connected to it, but they also arrived in history at specific po points in time. They were located. We're now waiting for the fourth angel's message to arrive in history. The fourth angel's message we call the loud cry, latter rain um, message. But Sister White says, don't move these. Not a peg or a pin is to be removed. So there's something important about retaining the location of these messages. Um, the point of reference. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet an end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. Years ago, when I was trying to come to grips with everything that that quote was saying, and I don't suggest that I understand everything that that quote is saying, but when I was trying to understand it better, one of the things that I realized, and I hadn't realized it before, um, and it's probably because my grasp on the English language is poor, but there are two words in the English language that are very, sound just the same. Complement with an I, and complement with an E. And in this quote, it says that, um, Revelation is the complement with an E of the book of Daniel. Complement with an I means you look very nice this evening. That's a complement with an I. But complement with an E means to bring to perfection. And what we're, being, what we're told here is that the, books, the book of Revelation brings to perfection the book of Daniel. You know, we, we believe that Daniel 11 verse 40 was fulfilled in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and that verse 40 of Daniel 11 is describing the alliance that took place between the papacy and Ronald Reagan to bring down the Soviet Union. That's, that's sound um, past history. That's fulfilled uh, prophecy at um, this point in time. But when we, when we share that information, there was, uh, how many know who Leonard Bernstein is? Leonard Bernstein, a real famous conductor in American history. He was also a real famous homosexual. And he had a son named Carl Bernstein. How many know who Carl Bernstein, his son, was? Carl Bernstein is the, the man that worked with, uh, who was the other guy he worked with in Watergate? Bernstein and, there was another reporter. That Carl Bernstein was a reporter, and he worked with another reporter, and they're the ones that blew the whistle on the Watergate cover-up that brought Nixon down. And there was even a movie about him. Uh, Robert Redford played the guy, I can't think his name, and uh, who, no, not Libby, he was the one that come down with him. These are the reporters that found these things out, and Dustin Hoffman played Carl Bernstein. And in any case, in the 1989 time period when the Soviet Union came down, Carl Bernstein, this famous Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, he did an article on how the Soviet Union was brought down through a secret alliance between the United States and the Vatican, and his article was in a Time magazine, and you've probably all seen the Time magazine where it says, Holy Alliance. Carl Bernstein is the one that wrote that article in Time magazine, Holy Alliance, and he says that when he came across that story, he realized that he'd come across the most important story he'd ever come across in his entire life. So he decided he would write a book, and he wrote a book instead of just one article on how the United States and the Vatican brought down the Soviet Union, he wrote a book called His Holiness, Pope John Paul II, 
and this, The Hidden Alliance of Our Time, I forget the subtitle. And when that book was released, he was interviewed about the contents of that book and the book on Larry King Live. And in, in the DVDs that we have of the Prophecy School, you'll see part of that interview. And Larry Q. King is interviewing Carl Bernstein. First starts off with, how did you write this book? And he says, well, uh, you know, I didn't know much about the Vatican. I'm, I'm, I'm a Jew raised in the United States, so I don't know anything about Catholicism, really. So I got a hold of a, an author in Italy that was familiar with the Vatican, traveled with the Vatican Corps, and he and I wrote it together. His name was Politi, something Politi. So this book was actually written by two people, Carl Bernstein and this Politi guy from Italy. And, and so Larry King asked him after he tells him that, he says, well, you know, when he submitted his part of the book and you submitted your part of the book, who wove it together? He says, well, I wove it together. Carl Bernstein said he wove it together. And uh, brothers and sisters, the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. Sister White says it over and over and over again. Daniel and Revelation are the same book. It's just that it's been written by two authors, Daniel and John, and the Holy Spirit has woven it together. This isn't a concept that we can't understand here and now. In, in, in the sooner we understand that Daniel and the Revelation are the same book, the, the sooner we have come to an understanding that present, prevents a lot of foolishness from coming into our understandings of Daniel and Revelation. Because if you're not seeing something reflected in Daniel, somebody, if I'm telling you something about Revelation that is nowhere represented in the book of Daniel, there's a warning flag that you ought to, that you ought to follow up on. Because they're the same book, the same book. They bring each other to perfection. Um, but notice that what we just read, all the books of the Bible meet an end in Revelation. If you're going to bring these timelines of history together, line upon line, to develop a, a prophetic illustration, the point of reference in the Bible that you use is the book of Revelation. It's the book that is pointed out as the, the point of reference for end time events. That's how we understand it as Seventh-day Adventists, but we may not really talk about it that often, and we should. That's the point of reference, the book of Revelation. Next quote, skipping over the definition of compliment. John beholds the things which will be in the last days and sees the people working counter to God. John, the author of the book of Revelation, he saw what was going on in the last days. And all the books of the Bible meet in the book of Revelation. All the prophets were speaking about the last days and the point of reference to bring these prophetic lines together is the book of Revelation. But don't believe that the book of Revelation is just the book of Revelation. It's not. The book of Revelation is also the book of Daniel. They're the same book. Testimonies to Ministers 117. She's speaking about a work of, of doing a commentary on these two books, a human commentary. Um, it was my idea to have the two books bound together, Revelation following Daniel, as given fuller light on the subjects dealt with in Daniel. The object is to bring these books together, showing that they both relate to the same subjects. Daniel and Revelation are dealing with the same subjects. Notice the next one. In the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Next quote, prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line, prophetic line upon prophetic line. The more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly we, shall we understand the prophecy of Daniel, for revelation is the supplement of Daniel. The old past, another concept we want to, we want to establish here at the beginning of our study. The, all we're doing here is putting down some fundamental points of reference for the rest of the weekend. Page four, God has given me light regarding our per periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak. A Seventh-day Adventist, what do we know about that? Do dead people speak? No, but God has said the dead are to speak. How? Their work shall follow them. We are to rep repeat the words of the pioneers in our work. Who knew what it cost to search for the truth is for hidden treasure and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. Who laid the foundation of our work? The pioneers. 
They move forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. One by one, these pioneers are passing away. The word given me is, let the, that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. Let the truths that are the foundation of our faith be kept before the people. Brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventists no longer know what's the foundation of Adventism. They don't know what the history of the Millerite movement was. They do not understand what truths were established during that time period. And I'm not saying that as a, a holier than thou or a smarter than thou person. I'm saying that from experience, asking Seventh-day Adventists, do you understand th these particular verses? And no hands will go up. I've asked questions like that to hundreds of Adventists all over the world. And there's, there's no responses. But also, we're going to show as we proceed in this weekend that that history and those truths were sealed up by God. It wasn't simply that, that we don't know them at the end of the world. Inspiration sealed that understanding up. So, how do we keep those truths before people if they've been sealed up? Next quote. The more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God, the deeper and surer even as the eternal throne will appear the truce of ancient prophecy, we shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets. These messages were given not for those that uttered their prophes the prophecies, but for those of us, but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. Once again, another emphasis not only on the, the pioneers, but that the prophets were speaking about the end of the world. Notice what Jeremiah says. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventist Church is no longer walking in the foundations of Adventism. And I'm not, I'm not being critical. I'm being accurate. It's, it, 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 and you'll see why. Notice this. Sister White talks about Isaiah 58 over and over again. She talks about Isaiah 58, Isaiah 56 through 58. This is our message. This is our work. She deals with it a great deal. This is from Isaiah 58. This is one of the, the passages that is identifying the work of God's people at the end of the world. And it says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. There are paths that we're supposed to be walking in that need to be restored. And that's why Jeremiah says, ask for the old paths. Something happened between the beginning of Adventism and the end of Adventism where we no longer understand what the foundations were. And as we said, we're going to show you that this was sealed up. Select the Messages, Book 1, page 157. There is a work of sacred importance for ministers and people to do. They are to study the history and the cause of the people of God. They are not to forget the past dealing of God with his people. They are to revive and recount the truths that have come to seem of little value to those who do not know by personal experience of the power and brightness that accompanied them when they were first seen and understood. In all their original fresh freshness and power, these truths are to be given to the world. What truths? The truths that were established at the beginning of Adventism. Again and again I've been shown that the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat last year a last year's almanac. The record is to be kept in mind. Why? For history will repeat itself. The reason we need to understand the beginnings of Adventism is because history is going to be repeated. If it had no bearing on the end of the world, we wouldn't need to be worrying about it. But it does. Not just the truths. It's just not, not just simply the doctrinal understandings. The experience that took place is going to be repeated. Um, there are some other hand, handouts, but anyway. In history and prophecy, the Word of God portrays the long continued conflict between truth and error. The conflict is, that conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Study, the re study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. Some prophecies, and this is a quote we're going to refer to over and over again this weekend, so I'm pointing it out to you here the first time we read it. 
Some, prophecy God, some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. When it's repeated over and over again in the Bible, that's, that means it's more important than when you just see it there twice. Not an accident when it's repeated. God repeated it on purpose. So, the book of Revelation is the point of reference. And in the first chapter of Revelation, Christ introduces himself as the one, of course, who organized, constructed, and brought the Revelation. The first chapter, when Christ shows himself, reveals himself to John, before he begi begins the to give the prophetic information in the rest of the book of Revelation, chapter 1 is where Christ identifies specific characteristics of himself that he refers through through the rest of the book of Revelation. And we all understand this is Seventh-day Adventist. How he's portrayed in chapter 1, we see him when he's portrayed throughout the rest of Revelation. We see those references that were developed in chapter 1 used over and over as the rest of the book of Revelation unfolds. Everyone follow what I'm saying? The one characteristic that he repeats more than any other and when he repeats something, what's it mean? It means it's more important. The one characteristic that he repeats in Revelation 1 of himself more than any other is that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And you can see these references here under the first and the last. And uh, let me have a, a time check, if you would, Glenn. 11 minutes. Okay, I'm going to refer you to these these quotes, we're not going to read them. If, you, if we are to understand what it means that Christ emphasized more than anything else in Revelation chapter 1 that he was the first and the last, what does that mean? I would point you to the book of Isaiah. From chapter 40 to the end of Isaiah, you will see over and over again what Isaiah is emphasizing is that God is the first, the last, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the ending. And as he's portraying God... In this fashion, he's identifying certain truths about God. Um, one of the truths you see here on the bottom of page 5, what proves that God is God is that he can portray the end from the beginning according to the Bible. Now, brothers and sisters, you, if, you've never, if you've ever talked to non-Christians that don't believe in God, don't understand anything about God, or, or Christians... Or, or people outside of Christianity, they, they might have some idea about God. The reality of it is, according to the Bible, the thing that proves that God is God, more than any other of the truths about God, is the fact that he has the ability to illustrate the end of the world from the beginning of the world. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that is the, necessarily the most important thing about his personality or his character or his divinity. I mean, God is love. That's you know, all-encompassing, but I'm saying what God identifies as the truth that proves that he's God is that fact, that he portrays the end from the beginning. And you can see here in Isaiah, on the bottom of page 5, some of those references. In Isaiah 41, 26, and you need to look at this on your own time, read the passage, um, God's righteousness is identified with his ability to portray the end from the beginning. Who hath declared the be from the beginning that we may know and before that we may say he is righteous? In these passages in Isaiah over and over again, he's taunting the, the people that worship idols. And he says, let these people that are worshiping idols bring their idols out and prove that they're gods by portraying the end of the world from the beginning of the world. Go ahead and let these idols come forth and portray the end of the world from the beginning of the world, and we'll know that these idols are righteous. God's righteousness is established on his ability to portray the end from the beginning. God's glory, you'll see in the next quote, is established upon his ability um, to identify the end from the former things. In the next quote, the generations from the beginning, he called the generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. You want to understand Babylon at the end of the world? Go back to Babylon at the beginning of the world. If you want to understand modern Israel at the end of the world, go to ancient Israel at the beginning of the world. The generations that he put into history are what are illustrating the end of the world. You want to understand radical Islam at the end of the world? 
go back and study Ishmael and his descendants at the beginning of the world. God has portrayed the end of the world from the generations that he established in his word. And this proves that who he is, what he is, and that he is God. Um, there's some other references um, from Isaiah. I'm running out of time. Um, let, turn to page 7, the bottom, where it says 144,000 from Isaiah 46, 8 through 13. Remember this and show yourselves, men. Bring it again to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, a man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, you stout-hearted, that are far off from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. The 144,000 are the glory of God at the end of the world. They give the final revelation of his character and the development of the 144,000 is directly related to God's ability to portray the end of the world from the beginning of the world. Uh, quick, quick examples in our final few minutes here. There are several ways in the scriptures that you see God's ability his, his signature that he is the first and the last. I'll give you some um, quick ones that maybe will strike a chord with you. We all are familiar with the 1260 year time prophecy of the papacy, right? Papacy ruled the world for 1260 years, correct? Everyone with me? What started this time prophecy? What is the, if you were going to teach a non-Adventist tonight, what was the historical event, and that's how you prove prophecy is fulfilled, what is the historical event that starts the 1260-year time prophecy? What was that? It's when the, that's correct. When the Goths were what? The, 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 head, the leader of the Goths, what did he do? He fled the city of Rome. That's what it says in history. He fled out of the city of Rome. He'd been controlling the city of Rome. And in, I think it was March of 538. I could be wrong on the month, but it was 538. The king of the Goths fled the city of Rome. That's the beginning of this time prophecy. How does this time prophecy come to an end? When the Pope of Rome is taken out of the city of Rome. The prophecy begins when a king is removed from Rome. The prophecy ends when a king is removed from Rome. Jesus has put his signature in that prophecy, the first and the last. There's several. The 2300 years, I'm skipping over one because of time. When did the 2300 year prophecy of Daniel 814 8, end? At Seventh day Adventist, everyone knows that. Go ahead and say it. October 22nd, 1844. Um, that was the third angel's message, right? Third angel's message arrived in history. Remember, we've already went over this. They have, they've been located in history. Third angel's message arrived at when the 2300 year prophecy ended. The first angel's message, 1840. Second angel's message, 1842. So the 2300 year prophecy ended on a third message. Where did it begin? On the third decree. Jesus began the prophecy on the third decree. He ends the prophecy on the third message. Uh, in the story uh, of the beginning of the 2300-year prophecy, what were they to do? What was the work that began in 457? It's been a long week. The rebuilding Jerusalem, right? They were going to come out of Babylon, restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Did they do it? No, they went into a backslidden condition, and the Lord had to raise up Nehemiah to finish the work, correct? Nehemiah is a symbol, symbol of the finishing of the work. Sister White says the work that was carried out by... The Jews in rebuilding Jerusalem is a symbol of the work that Adventists are to do. And if you look at the story of Nehemiah, before he finished the work, what did he do? He secured a fourth decree. Remember that? He got a decree from the king before he went back to Jerusalem. What are we waiting for today? Fourth angel's message. The beginning of this time prophecy is illustrating the end of this time prophecy. 
Jesus puts his signature in prophecy in a variety of ways. I've ran out of time. I was going to show you a couple more. Um, one that always amazes me. The patriarchs, or the, the um, conflict of the ages series. We're all familiar with the conflict of the ages series. It begins with um, patriarchs and prophets and ends with the great controversy. How many years did it take to bring those books together? Now, we have someone here that works at Pacific Press. They probably know. How many years was it from the, from the first publication of the great controversy, which came first, until the conflict of the ages series was complete? I'm afraid I don't know. I don't know that either, but we all know it was a lot of years. That's not important. It was a lot of years. But how does the very beginning of the Conflict of the Ages series, what are the three words it begins with? God is love. Oh, how's it end? God is love. Do you think that Sister White did that on purpose? I don't. I think the Lord made sure that he began that story right where he ends it because he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And there's a variety of ways that Jesus illustrates this in prophecy and that's this is the premier principle we're going to use tomorrow and Sunday shall we pray <clears throat> Heavenly Father we thank you for bringing us together this Sabbath we thank you for abiding with us we ask you to refresh our minds that we might understand what you have for us and that we might be discerning to um, recognize truth and recognize error. We want to be among those that rightly divide the word of truth. And Lord, we realize we're at the end of the world and that you are trying to awaken your people to finish the work. We want to be among those that are participating in this work and we ask that you do what it takes to make this happen in our lives. And if there's any way that this weekend can be used by you to accomplish that and all of us here, we ask and give you permission to do so in Jesus' name.